Hey kids, you're listening to the internet's wettest podcast about video games, consoles, and pancakes. The SML Podcast. What's up, everybody? This is the SMO Podcast, and it's our Halloween episode. <laughs> what up, sluts? <laughs> Aki's here. Bree's here. How are you two doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Either of you do anything fun for Halloween? I, I just handed out candy. Movies. Yeah. I, I, wa- I watched two Halloween movies and... Ate an unnecessarily large amount of candy and uh, built some of a gunpla that came in today that I've been super excited for. Nice. So, what gunpla I, did you get? I got a gunpla called the Nobel Gundam, and it's this cute uh, sailor outfitted, basically, uh, Gundam that's very feminine. It's super cute looking. You should give out gunpla for Halloween. For that shit's come way up. too expensive. You just give him a gunpla. <laughs> I have a friend who gives out Funko Pops. How much are mm. Funko Pops? Like, well, it depends on what they are and if they're valuable or if they're just like clearance shit. But normal price are like 12 bucks or 15 bucks, something like that. Yeah, oh, Gunpla wow. costs more. I'm not handing out Gunpla. I'm not made out of fucking money. Sure. Uh-huh. You have enough. You can get uh, rid of a few. <laughs> my mom also handed out ornaments. She's a potter and she makes uh, jack o' lantern and she made some ornaments with these different stamps like pumpkins and skulls and spider webs and things and so we handed out ornaments along with the candy and it was pretty well received very cool do you have, do you have any pictures of that stuff i'd love to see some yeah. of those ornaments if there yeah. are any more yeah i can get some pictures we'll post it in the discord yeah yeah everybody we have a discord fucking join, yeah, join it. it come hang out with us <laughs> post pictures uh, talk about movies and games and music and all that fun stuff <laughs> at pictures. Oh, yeah. I also almost emptied the room that I'm trying to empty for my new bed that's coming. I've almost finished that room. It's only taken me a week and a half, but, you know, hey, slow and steady wins the race or some other bullshit like that. I, I did <laughs> finally post something in the Discord. It was it was feet pics. You inspired my wife to buy new socks, by the way. All right. Well, there you go. Yeah. She loves them. She, she's like, these are the most comfortable socks I have. They're soft. They're fuzzy. They're warm. And they look like cat feet. Mm -hmm. Nice. So you inspired her. You are leading the charge of cat feet socks. Yay. Now I need to find them in my size. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so what has everyone been up to this past week? I mean, I know it's been a long time since we've talked. It's been, what, two days? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's been, been a long one. I've been so busy. Like, it's been like a week since those two days happened. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way, actually. Review games, man. Just review games. I don't do anything but review games, <laughs> realistically <laughs> speaking. Oh, my God. I did more cooking. I had had some good meals. I did uh, fondue tonight, like a, a traditional Ooh. cheese fondue, and uh, had some salad and some pot stickers earlier as an appetizer. That's not did the pot you? I thought you were going to talk about for a second. No, no. Did, did you stick <laughs> the salad the into the right fondue? <laughs> did you stick the salad into the fondue? No, we stuck bread into the fondue. Yeah, no. Uh, did no, you put I the salad, like salad on the bread then? Oh. No, oh. I just ate the salad. It was good salad. Mm. I had a salad tonight, too. Yeah? Yeah. Good the stuff. chicken Caesar salad from Domino's. Oh, nice. Yeah, Ashley wanted a sandwich, so I got her a sandwich. I'm like, I don't feel like pizza, and I don't feel like they're buffalo chicken, so I'm going to try a salad. Uh, it hit the spot. It was pretty good. Nice. Nice. 
I had a salad if you take out all the salad, add refried beans and cheese. (laughs) Yeah, that counts. Yeah, there we go. I ate a salad. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) It it was a bean salad. That's all. (laughs) Uh, We should probably address the elephant in the room. Jacob's not here. His kids were trick-or-treating today, and he'll be joining... Uh, sometime, hopefully before review, since he's the lead review tonight, but we'll find yeah. out. Yeah. We'll find out. We'll take if it as it, it comes. If it takes too long, it just means I get my reviews done faster. I'm, I'm fine with this. True. Yeah, I gotta be up at 7 a.m., so that's fun. Yeah, <laughs> you, you have a fun day planned tomorrow, don't you? I do. I'm gonna be uh, driving for around eight, eight, nine hours uh, between everything said and done. I uh, I get to go visit Lloyd Berry on my way to uh, uh, Joe's house. Yep, we're gonna party. We're gonna party. I've got candy and uh, other goodies, so we're gonna have fun. And we have cats. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So. News? Should we get to news? Is there anything else sure. to talk about? Um, I don't know. I didn't do anything this past week. Like, I haven't done shit lately. Yeah, I, fair. Uh, yeah. I dehydrated some fruit. That was my other exciting thing. I mean, it's exciting to me. Dehydrated some apples, some blueberries. Good stuff. Nice. What, what do you do with, dehyd- with these dehydrated fruits? Do you just eat them as snacks, or do you put them eat in them, stuff? Put them in oatmeal, put them in yogurt... Okay. Yeah, you can take the, the dehydrated blueberries. They 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 last a long time, and then you can make like blueberry muffins. I just put them in my oatmeal. I like dehydrated strawberries for my oatmeal with a little bit of maple syrup and some like cream. It's good stuff. And now I'm hungry nice. again. Damn it! <laughs> well, at least you have candy to munch on. Uh, yeah, you shouldn't eat no more candy. When you eat like thirty or forty fucking. Pa- tiny packages of Whoppers. You you learn real quick. You probably shouldn't eat no more candy. <laughs> well, that's a lot. Yeah. A lot. How much yeah. did you spend on candy again? <laughs> Thirty-one bucks. Damn. <laughs> that is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, Horror Acolyte has some news. I guess we could. Uh. Oh God, Jacob just jumped online. There he is. God. Damn it. Shut up. <laughs> Everyone talk. Everyone stop talking about him. Okay. Hi, Jacob. Uh, hi. Talking about Riz that. and Skibbity Toilet and all that. Um, not much. I mean, my kids just got home from trick-or-treating, and uh, now I sent them to bed, and they're very upset because I told them that they couldn't read tonight because, you know, they have school tomorrow morning, and... If anything, they're probably just going to read in secret, which is, you know, part of my <laughs> secret plan, you know, were, to encourage them to read. So, you know. Were they not uh-huh. happy that they didn't get the, all their candy? Well, what do you mean? No, it's like downstairs. Like, they didn't eat all of it. They ate some of it. Yeah, you can't eat all of it. It's not a, it's not a, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint with Halloween. Candy. Yeah. Like, I mean, you have to oh, eat so a yeah. bunch of. You have to eat a bunch and then I ate everything. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, because you're such a terrible kid and no one would ever want to give you candy. So, oh, I made bank as a kid. I was a cute kid. Mm, I don't believe it. All cute as kids. Let's be fair. Joe, I've seen pictures of you. You were not a cute baby. I was. I was very horrible. No, I actually won a Halloween contest one year with some. Some clown costume my mom made for me, and uh, one like a, a, a year supply of candy or something. Dang! Damn. Yeah. What kind of candy did you win? Whisper. Never heard of it. Never heard yeah. of it. I was really hoping you were going to say candy corn. No, it's like some there, chocolate bar. There was some kid show that we had on our area called Hatchy Malachi. Oh yeah, yeah. My brother actually won a Tootsie Roll bank filled with Tootsie Rolls on the show when they drew his name randomly. Nice. How, how big was the bank? I don't, it, I don't know. It was like a giant, like maybe three feet tall. Okay. Like a cylinder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. How yeah. many of them did you steal? 
I don't remember. <laughs> a lot of them. That, it's amazing. Right, I remember right. this to begin with. <laughs> Fair. Old people. Uh, good jokes. So, Jacob, what have you been up to? Uh, working, playing video games for the podcast. It's pretty much about it. Nice. Yeah. Not, not, nothing that exciting. So, so that means you can speak for more than two minutes on your games, right? Uh, maybe if I feel like it. Oh, shit. <laughs> Why? So that means no. <laughs> Anyway, should we get to, to news? Because we I, have I, don't, some new- I, don't, I don't get the joke. What? See, if I have to explain it, it ceases to be funny. News. Okay. Hold on, I got a button for this. And now I got another button. It's Movie Watch. <laughs> there. Uh, Horror Acolyte said there's an Outlast movie in the works. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She just means well, some of your reviews are short. Who cares? Whatever. Mm. Not every game could be a 10 minute long review. I mean, you cover a lot of $5 games. <laughs> There's not a lot to talk about in some of those. <laughs> Let's be real. Her story. Bree can attest to that. You cover a lot of, a lot of cheap ones, too. I do. You I stream do. them, too. How do you make like hour long streams out of some of these games? <laughs> That's a really good question. I think I use the cats to stretch things sometimes. <laughs> Cat time. Also, don't you yeah. usually, when you're doing your streams, don't you usually play a couple different games? I do, yeah. I'll do, like, like in the afternoon streams, I do, like, four or five games at once just to, like, yeah, get through them all. So, yeah, news. Outlast movie. What do, you th- what, what do y'all think of an Outlast movie? Nah. I mean, I, I don't I don't recall if I've ever played any of the games. I might have played one of them back like when I first got my Xbox three or yeah, 360 uh, Xbox one. And Joe handed me like a shit ton of games when I first got it. So I know one of them was one of the, like one of those games was in there, but I don't remember anything about it. So I'm just mm. OK. But Jacob, yeah, any other I movie like news it. since we did the intro? You usually have movie and TV news. Yes, two other video game movies have been announced. Uh, Apple is developing an Oregon Trail movie. It's going to be an action comedy from Will Speck and Josh Gordon. Um, they're going to be directing. and what have they done? That is a good point or question. Uh, <laughs> I, oh. I don't recognize the name, so... I don't know. Uh, the Lucas Brothers and Max Reisman are... Uh, well, Lucas Brothers did Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, I'm trying... They... Uh, the guys who are directing also did... Um, they did Lyle Lyle Crocodile and... Who's specking the court? Okay. Uh, they also did Blades of Glory and Office Christmas Party. Leads of Glory. Was that the, the Will Ferrell, John, John Heater? Yeah. I like that one. Off- yeah, I thought it was all right. Office Christmas Party was a lot better than I expected it to be. Um, like, it wasn't I think great. I've seen that one. It's on the Voodoo account if you want to watch it. Um, and then the writers are, or wait, no, the producers uh, for it, they worked on Only Murders in the Building. Never heard of that either. It's a show on Hulu. It's got Steve uh, Martin, Martin Short, and uh, Selena Gomez. Interesting. It's supposed to be pretty good. But yeah, I've heard good things about that. We don't have Hulu, though. So there's no. too many services. Yeah. Uh, and there, I have one other bit of movie news uh, that got announced today, actually. Paul W.S. Anderson, famed director of the Resident Evil series and the first Mortal Kombat movie, and also Monster Hunter, is coming back, and he's going to write and direct The House of the Dead. Ooh. A lot of people give the Resident Evil movies shit, but I really enjoy them. I think his movies are are generally, generally pretty entertaining. So between Mortal Kombat 1... The RE movies. I'm. I'm. I think I'm gonna 
check that one out when it comes out. It sounds like it has potential. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I mean, too. I mean, I'll, I'll check it out, but, um, I don't know. Resident Evil. I think the series went downhill uh, after Apocalypse, the second one. I mean, it went downhill, but also went off the rails. So, eh. yeah, I I love the Resident Evil movies. They are they just block, did their but they are fantastic. Thing. Yeah, they're fun. Plus Mila Jovovich. So, mm. yeah, I wonder if he's going to have her star in this one as well. I wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> yeah, married, he's almost. Aren't they? Get- they are. He almost gets into like Rob Zombie uh, territory <laughs> with casting her and all of his stuff. I'll Except take she can act. over. Yeah, Sherry Moon Zombie. Yeah, Sherry Moon can't act for shit. Yeah. I'll take Mila over fucking Rob Zombie. I don't particularly like his movies. The only one of his I really enjoyed was The Devil's Rejects, and it's mostly a, like a rewrite of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. So it's like, eh. Yeah, I didn't like House of a Thousand Corpses. I saw that in a theater, and then we saw, I don't remember when we saw it, but I thought Devil's Rejects was great. I thought it was just a great action movie. It wasn't trying mm-hmm. to be gore, porn, horror. It was just crazy over-the-top action. I liked it. No, oh, anyway. yeah, Lords, Lords of Salem. I forgot about that one. I think everyone forgets about it. And also, don't forget, <laughs> he, he did the Munsters movie that went direct to video. I didn't watch that one. Uh, I don't want to know how he bastardized the Munsters. The, the, monst- the Munsters? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from what I understand, if you're a fan of the original show, like very much like the original show uh it it has like it kind of gives that vibe and like but if you're looking for like a modern adaptation or if you're looking for anything that's actually good then no (laughs) anything that's good speaking of things that aren't good uh some more news sony has shut down concord developer firewalk studios and concord is dead for good i was a little surprised by that Uh i'm not not gonna lie i really thought that they were going to uh relaunch this free to play yeah i mean i thought it like i mean how much money do they spend on that hundreds of millions yeah, like I figured that was like some sort of like too big to fail thing. I've heard reports of two to five hundred. Jesus. Yeah. Oof, big oof. Yeah. That episode of Secret Level is going to be even more awkward <laughs> now. I wonder if they can the episode. No, they said that they w- will not. Mm. Like it's interesting. It's done. It's recorded. It's just has to air. That's it. <laughs> Uh, Sony also shut down mobile developer Neon Koi. I don't know what they did. Nothing really. Mobile stuff. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, like, sometimes no mobile stuff is, like, noteworthy. Not really. Yeah, it, it's always noteworthy sometimes. on it can make them a lot of money because those games are trash filled with microtransactions. Yeah, it so, depends on the mobile game. Some are pay to own. Those are good. Sometimes. Yeah. Speaking of apps, Nintendo launched Nintendo Music, a smartphone app filled with, get this, Nintendo Music. What? Wow. I wonder Uh, how long this is going to last before they cancel it. I hope it sticks around. It sounds like a really good idea and people are responding positively to it. Uh, You have to be a Nintendo Switch Online subscriber, but there's no additional cost if you are a subscriber for (laughs) this. And they have music from, like, all of their history. Um, my one friend was excited because they have the Wii menu theme <laughs> on there. And you can oh, yeah. loop it for an it's hour. I could, I could totally jam out to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that could than- actually be pretty great. Just, like, looping, like, certain, like, Mario Brothers music. Hell yeah. That would be pretty fantastic. Earthbound music. Oh, I'll fire that shit up. I want to listen to some Earthbound. Uh, Nintendo also announced Xenoblade Chronicles X Definitive Edition is going to be hitting the Switch March 20th. Nice. That's cool Mm. for people who uh, like that series. 
Yeah, I've only heard good things about those games. I think that marks the entire series now being available on the Switch. It was stuck on the Wii U for a while. Very awesome. Yeah. Uh, PlayStation Plus lineup for November was announced. Uh, They're getting Hot Wheels Unleashed 2 Turbocharged. Okay. Okay. Ghostwire Tokyo. Not bad. And Death Note Killer Within, which is a day one launch. I've not Hmm. heard of that. That could be interesting. I think it's one of those, like, social deduction online multiplayer games. Oh, never mind then. I take back everything I just said. (laughs) It might be on other platforms, though. I I haven't followed up on it, but it could be interesting. I still think it's a solid lineup. Hot Wheels is pretty good, and... Ghostwire, like Ghostwire is confusing because it was part of the extra catalog and a lot of people are pissed that this is basically a repeat. It's a great game, though. Okay. And it's, it's weird. Game. It's another Xbox title being given away. Well, what, what, what can Xbox say? PlayStation <laughs> players really like Xbox games. I'm, I'm really curious to see what's going to happen uh, with Indiana Jones. Because I'm wondering if they're going to have a PS5 Pro version of the game. Or if they're going to keep it system parity between the two versions. Because how pissed off would people be if the, quote, enemy platform is getting the better versions of games? Yeah. I'm kind of curious to see how that's going to lead. There's... Rumors that there's going to be PS5 Pro versions, a Fable, a Vowed, everything they're they're saying. So who knows what Xbox is planning these days? I just want a I reason mean, to own an Xbox. I mean, to be fair, for the Pro upgrades, not all of them are particularly impressive, and you only need like one or two out of this big list of mostly unimpressive upgrades for it to be considered an an upgraded version. So it may not actually be all that much better, actually. I'm hearing Final Uh, Fantasy VII Rebirth is like night and day on the PS5 Pro. That doesn't shock me. Mm. Yeah. It seems like the the Pro might be a a pretty beefy upgrade, and if, if devs take good advantage of it... There could be some impressive stuff on there. Nice. Good on you know, PlayStation people who decide to spend that much money yeah. for an upgrade. I still I'm think not it's upgrading. way too much. <laughs> I, I can't imagine. Giving Sony who enough is. money at this point. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah. That, I think that thing is entirely too damn expensive, but, you know, yeah. people will pay because people paid the exorbitant prices back when they were scalping the PS5s and they spend over a thousand dollars on them so yeah. people will buy these I, I, uh, some people have more money than brain cells present company included <laughs> Jacob no me <laughs> oh <laughs> but you too but <laughs> Uh, last bit of news I have is that Brian Horton, the creative director of Marvel's Wolverine, has left Sony and has joined as the creative director for Perfect Dark. Interesting. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So that's an interesting jump. I wonder what led to that. Someone pissing in his Wheaties one too many times? Who knows? Uh, Aki, any news on your end? God, no, I'm too tired for that. Bree, what about you? Disney Dreamlight Valley. Ah, fuck. (laughs) Not gonna say anything, not gonna say anything. (laughs) (laughs) Bree, now you've got to tell us just so he can't. I I didn't actually read it. There was a headline. There there was a headline of something new, but I didn't actually read what it was even at all this time. (laughs) You just wanted to fuck with Jacob. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. I love it. Bree, you're my hero. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, tell us about the Disney Dreamlight news. So, they had a... Uh, what are those live event things called? I actually tuned in for one for once because, like, you know, it's something I actually care about. Uh, like a state like, of play. 
Yeah, one of those things. And so pretty much what it is is uh, they gave us the timeline for everything from now to uh, pretty much like summer 2025-ish. Um, so big news uh, on the regular game front is that Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas is coming. Uh, she'll be hitting the game at the beginning of December and uh there's going to be a bunch of improvements that are included with that uh along with a new star path which is obviously going to be like christmas and nightmare before christmas themed um but the big thing that it's bringing in with that uh that will be free to all users is it's going to introduce floating islands so if you've ever like been in the game and you've noticed off in the distance you see those islands that are floating in the air uh, you're now going to get four of them that are tethered to specific biomes. And essentially what they are is just like a blank slate. You can mess with uh, like the geography of it as you want. Like if you want a river in there, if you want hills in there, uh, if you just want streets, you can do that. Um, but pretty much it's based on how much we've all been like, we're running out of space in our valley and we need places to put all the new people that you're introducing. Um, and so if you want to, you could just make it like entire neighborhoods, uh, for all of the characters and they will be able to exist both within your valley and in these, uh, floating islands or over in the rift of time, uh, spot that you can go to uh the other thing that you're going to be able to do is when you're placing buildings and certain objects it's not everything but um some items instead of having uh four degrees of how you're going to be able to rotate them so like pretty much you know like up down left right kind of stuff it's now going to be 16 degrees of uh however positioning or whatever you want to call it um so if like you want to have a house that's like sitting in the corner with like you know like a little triangle of like a backyard you can do it if you want um so there's going to be a lot more freedom to be able to design your valley as you see fit uh which is pretty cool and then uh, the big meat of the whole thing was the introduction of the Storybook Veil, vale, which is going to be the next paid expansion. Um, it's going to be 30 bucks, I believe. It releases on uh, November 20th. And this one picks up right where uh, A Rift in Time left off with... Well, at this point, I, I could talk about the ending for Rift in Time, because if you haven't played it already, well, too bad. Um, <laughs> so at the very end, it hinted at Hades and Melissafin, uh, characters from Hercules and Sleeping Beauty, respectively, um, being introduced as the new big bads for the next story. But it wasn't confirmed, but of course, like, you know, hinted at that they might eventually show up. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and along with it, we're getting Merida, uh, from brave and Flynn Rider from tangled. Awesome. Um, they're going to be like your new companions. Hades also gets to be kind of a companion, uh, with it because what they're doing is that in instead of how rift of rift in time was split up into three parts, uh, they were listening to player feedback and how much we were like, there really wasn't much to do like with the story that you gave us and on top of it, you spread it out for like way too far along. And so what they're going to do is that we get part one in November. And then I think it's like late spring, we get part two. Um, so uh, Hades really takes up part one. Melissa Fint, while she shows up in part one is really for part two. And then there is also a secret character that they weren't going to describe, but if you were watching the pic, like if you were watching it, like ninety nine percent of a chance it's going to be Princess Aurora from um, Sleeping Beauty is going to show up. Yeah. Um, so along with that, we get uh, two new types of animal companions. I forget what one of them is. <laughs> we get 
two new types of animal companions. One of them, I forget what it is. I think it's based on something that already exists. Like, I think it might be like dogs or something like that. I forget. Um, but the other one is dragons, uh, which Fucking they look yeah. kind of cool. <laughs> um, dragons are awesome. But um, uh, the other thing that they're going to introduce, much like how Rift in Time introduced the Scramble Coin game, which is this like little mini game that you can play against uh, people in the valley. There's now going to be these puzzles that you have to catch these like butterfly looking things uh, all throughout the valley. And what they do is that they form little puzzle pieces, which you then can turn into tapestries that you can hang around uh, in your home, which I mean, it, it looked neat. Uh, I guess it gives something to do with like all the puzzles that we've been collecting uh, in the game. I but um <laughs> yeah i don't know but uh they also introduced the timeline for that uh so early 2025 it looks like we're going to be getting aladdin and jasmine um which makes sense because jafar was the big bad for rift in time um spring 2025 they showed a picture of the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland, so Yay. we don't know who's coming, but it's assumed at least the Cheshire Cat uh, will be showing up, possibly Alice. Um, and then summer 2025, we're going to get to explore the Skull Rock, which is this rock uh, over in Dazzle Beach that looks like, can anybody guess? No, I'm falling asleep. A dildo. Asleep. No. I mean, Aki, I mean, whatever you shove up there, I don't I don't know. I mean, if you could fit a whole skull, that's impressive and frightening, and I think you should talk to your doctor about that. But <laughs> anyway. Just have to crush it between your thighs first. <laughs> death by Snoo Snoo, a warrior's death. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um so anyways, Skull Rock, we're going to actually, like, there was, like, one little mission where we got to, like, go into a little room of it, and then we're, we're never able to enter it again. This time, we're actually going to be able to enter it, um, and they're going to explore it more, um, which is pretty cool, because, I mean, like, it, it it's kind of like how War, uh, War, World of Warcraft made it so you had a reason to, like, visit all of the realms that uh, we're like from previous expansions and stuff like that. So they're going to reuse that kind of stuff. Um, I'll be honest. You're losing me here. This is going too long. Well, shut up. This is like, <laughs> dude, they, had, they gave like a 29 minute presentation. So and it's so like, are you <laughs> it was, no, actually I'm not, but, um, oh, and then the other thing is that, uh, they're going to be introducing new versions of the games that you can buy. Uh, so if you don't buy it before, if you don't buy the Enchanted Edition before November 20th, uh, you're going to lose out on that version and some of the special stuff that that one came with. Instead, they're going to introduce a new version. Um, and that one is going to include a new style for your house and Baby Pegasus as an animal companion. Mm. Which I was just like, ah, oh, shit, I need that. So, anyways, that's uh, that's that. Okay, I'm going to rewind this crap a little bit to something that's only ever so slightly important to me when it comes to this gibberish. You're getting Sally. What about Jack and Zero? Jack's already there. Okay, He's what about Zero? Uh, so, there is... There is no zero yet, but you can purchase a uh, fox that's dressed up as zero. They need kinda to like fix a, that. Kind of like a how a lot of people think that there will eventually be a zero, but um, yeah, it's just currently you have a fox that's dressed up as zero. All right, that's all I needed to know. We can. They we also did never talk about this ever again. They also <laughs> did that with. Um, uh, there's a. I don't remember if it's a raccoon or a fox, but it's dressed up as like a Chinese dragon. Uh, they did that with Mulan. So they're kind of expanding into pets that are dressed up in costumes. Huh. Speaking Drop of pets, Simon pets. is on that right now, just hanging out. And uh, Injury, thank you for the hundred biddies. Thank you so much. A Mountain Dew on you. 
I will cheers to you with my star spangled splash. And uh, thank you for the biddies. So what other news do you got? What other non Disney? Please for the love of God, say none. (laughs) Uh, I actually have one other bit of news. Uh, with the Pokemon leaks that have been coming out, it turns out that we missed out on a new Eevee evolution. There was going to be a flying one, but apparently Game Freak thought that it was being uh, that their designs were cl- too close to fan art that already existed, and so they scrapped it. Huh. Yeah. So, Bree, did you have any other news, or were you just... No, I didn't have anything this week. Nothing? You I had literally seen the just wanted movie. to pick on Jacob. I, I did, yeah. That's adorable. <laughs> so, any other news anyone want to talk about? Any any other subjects, or should we dive into reviews? Reviews, yeah, please. Jacob? What? You good? Yeah, I'm good. All right. First game to talk about tonight is Call of Duty Black Ops 6. Code provided to us by Activision for the purpose of this coverage, developed by Treyarch, Raven Software, and the rest of Activision, published by Activision, released October 25th on Xbox One, Series X and S, PS4, PS5, PC for $69.99. Developed by Treyarch and Raven, Black Ops 6 is a spy action thriller set in the early 90s, a period of transition and upheaval in global politics characterized by the end of the Cold War and the rise of the United States as a single superpower. With a mind-bending narrative and unbound by rules of engagement, this is signature Black Ops. Jacob, tell us about Call of Duty Black Ops 6. Holy crap. So... Compared to Modern Warfare 3, which came out last year, this is a huge breath of fresh air uh, with this. It is, I mean, it's just solid uh, <laughs> to be uh, to begin with. So uh, I'm going to start with a single player campaign first. Um, and that is, as you were saying, it was set in the early 1990s, um, around the time that Bill Clinton is about to be getting into office, 1991-ish. So. Uh, if you know your world history, Bill Clinton was about to be elected. Uh, USSR is falling. Um, and Woods, who got uh, seriously messed up back in Panama, he has this little group that had to rescue this guy out in Iraq. And then uh, you get you finally pick him up. And there's now this like paramilitary group called Pantheon that he's more afraid of than like, than he's afraid of you. And he's just like, yeah, man, like whatever, just get me out of here. Uh, I'm going to go with you. And uh, of course, Pantheon rolls up and dude's dead. And you're back at Washington and uh, you have to answer for your crimes. And then all of a sudden, everything in Washington is going to shit spectacularly. And like what so mirrors real life. <laughs> uh you know, honestly, if there was this much gunplay happening in Washington, DC, I would be freaking out about the state of my country. So which also I'm just like, hmm, what if that does happen? Um <laughs> but uh there is some wild stuff that goes on there and it is full i mean there are missions where the game is just like yo if you want to do stealth you can do stealth if you want to go in with guns blazing whatever man like (laughs) take them out uh and i really do appreciate that it was actually kind of fun uh being able to mix that up as i wanted to as i was moving through levels uh there are some parts where your only option is stealth and that can be pretty frustrating especially for me who never uses stealth i i hate it i just want to like go in there and kill everyone um and so it was a little frustrating but at the same time it was kind of fun figuring out how the game wanted me to move about uh to get stuff done and uh yeah and it's just you end up getting like all these like exciting climaxes in these missions um like where everything is just going to shit and you have to get out of there uh and make it back uh to the mansion that you're hiding out in um yeah like uh there's an early mission early on uh where you're on the back of a motorcycle and you're just shooting up uh bad guys in like the streets of washington dc it is wild um 
But what's also really cool in this is that it's just not like a straight campaign where, you know, it's like, all right, shoot all these people, go to the next mission. Uh, There are perks that you can purchase to enhance your character uh, using money that you'll find uh, throughout the campaign. Um, And doing so, it can be like, I mean, sometimes it's simple stuff like uh, like you can get more health or you can carry more ammo. Other times, it's like certain enemies are like now are you are going to drop more money if you shoot them, or like you're now quote unquote magnetic, and anytime you just buy walk by armor plates, they just like attach to you. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's just like so you can you can customize that to your own style as you're going through the game, and it's just it's really cool, and I'm really glad that it's just not a string of like go here go like you know all right go here now tail back and they really took their time to make these levels huge and expansive and it's just (laughs) like it's exciting it's like watching it like it's a it's a summer blockbuster movie that you are playing um yeah of all the reviews i've seen of this game so far everyone is praising the campaign in this one yeah like it, it's it's really well done and on top of it um there are some accessibility features that i thought were really cool because i'm getting older my eyesight's not as great as it used to be um when i'm playing these kind of games and they now have a feature that makes it or i mean the thing is that uh modern warfare 3 might may have had this but i wasn't aware of it this game it actually like like at when you're starting up it actually spells out all right here's some accessibility features that you can have and you can tack them on they don't affect your uh achievements or anything like that but uh the one that i was really appreciative of is that it actually will highlight the people on the map um in very like in various colors so allies are colored all in blue uh, enemies are colored all in red and so even though it's going to be like a really dark level or something like that it makes it so much easier for me to be able to see and like know where to shoot and it creates a way less frustrating experience of having died because i couldn't see where the heck the game you know wanted me to point my gun and shoot wow um, <laughs> No, they're not like they're not though. Uh it doesn't operate quite like that. Uh. Um it's just like if they're in your line of vision, you can see where they're at. Gotcha. Um but like if they go hide behind something, they are hidden. So um it's a really nice feature and it it definitely makes it uh a more enjoyable game uh for everyone. Uh and multiplayer was <laughs> I got my ass kicked a lot, which is not surprising. Um, but what I really enjoyed about that is that there's actually a tutorial for multiplayer that uh, that you it's optional if you want to skip it, but they encourage you to do it. And what it does is that it runs through like here's all the different motions that you could do. Here's like here's different things that you can also do. Like you you could do this like running leap. Uh, which then makes it easier for you to shoot people. Uh, theoretically, I don't, I don't know. I, I kept dying so many damn times <laughs> during that part. Um, but uh, it also like explains like how different like ordinances work, um, and it just tries to make you a better player. Like, so if you don't have like aim labs, uh, which we had reviewed earlier this year. Um, this tutorial thing can actually help improve your skills a little bit, Ooh. which I thought was nice. Um, and matchmaking is pretty beefy. I kept getting my ass shot and I mean, I was getting kills thankfully. And some of them were pretty cool, like doing takedowns or throwing like knives, um, ha- like across the room at people as they were entering in the door. Um, that was pretty fun, but it's like, it's a lot of standard stuff. Um, the only thing I didn't get to check out yet is zombies. And that's because I, I prefer to play that with friends. You kind of need it. It, Yeah. It it fills in the, it fills in the hole that left for dead left, which is a weird sentence to say, (laughs) but, um, 
but yeah, like multiplayer, it's fast, it's fun. Um, the only problem is that there were a couple of times where I was spawning right in front of the person who had just killed me. Um, <laughs> so it's it's nice to see that you know all these years after I had played the like the original Call of Duty three, uh, they still haven't quite fixed uh, you know spawn <laughs> points getting shot. Yeah, the spawn points and getting shot by other people like immediately <laughs> upon spawning. So, <laughs> oh, so geez. yeah, but yeah, I'm I'm having a lot of fun with this. Uh, this is definitely staying on my uh, on my Xbox for a while. Um, it, Which is so impressive, like, given how much space it could take. <laughs> it actually doesn't take up nearly as much as you think. Um, so that there depends is on, on what portions you download as well which is cool that they have it in segments that you could choose like i want multiplayer i want zombies i want single player i want these other games that are part of the whole call of duty launcher because they can't just make separate games anymore yeah i mean well that's what i was actually going to talk about because like uh like a lot of the online reviews early on were just like oh my god it takes up over 200 gigs Blah, blah 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 um the thing is it really doesn't if you just only install black ops 6 it's only like 80 gigs i think ish um which yeah it really wasn't that bad um and you have the option to install any other call of duty games that uh use that launcher that you own so if you want to clear out more space you can and i like it makes sense for those people who do nothing like who who only own a console to play call of duty or madden and stuff like that um you know i mean there are gamers out there like that's their bread and butter so yeah i thought that that was i thought that was kind of neat especially also like if i just as you were saying if you just want to install the campaign you could just have the campaign on there um which was always one of my things with call of duty uh because i really don't care about the multiplayer i only care about the single player campaign and so i thought that was kind of neat that they finally separated it cool well we got to talk price on this one it's a 70 dollars game it includes the xbox one and the series x and s versions of the game the pc version is a separate purchase on xbox uh, which I think is a bummer considering how they push Xbox play anywhere, but maybe this was too late in the game to make it happen. Uh, it is also available with game pass for the, for the first time it launches on game pass. What are your thoughts on this game as a whole as game pass? Uh, give us all your thoughts. Um, in terms of price, hell yeah. Like this is an excellent return to form. If you felt like you got burned by modern warfare three last year, like ignore that game, jump in with this. This one's definitely worth it. Um, in terms of game pass, like if you already have game pass and you're a little like, I don't know if I want to spend the $70, just play it on game pass. Like it's there, play it. <laughs> like it's an awesome game. You should really check it out. Cool. Sounds good. All right. Next game, Potionomics Masterwork Edition, developed by uh, Voracious Games, published by Xseed Games, released October 22nd on Series X and S Switch PS5 for $29.99. After the untimely death of her uncle, a penniless witch named Sylvia finds herself the inheritor of a potion shop and massive debt. Although Sylvia is barely a novice, it's up to her to build the business and save herself. Thankfully, she won't have to go it alone. With help from some new friends, Sylvia will hone her negotiation skills, outsell her craftiest competitors, and make her shop the number one potion destination in the land. It's all about mastering the finer points of Potionomics. Aki, tell us about your time with Potionomics Masterwork Edition. Ah, okay. In this, you play as a young potion maker witch type and your uncle has is also doing this as a professional he moves to this little island and starts up his business and you two don't really communicate all that much after that but he sends you a i'm dead as a doornail letter uh telling you hey Come here, don't let my all my efforts be in vain and let this place close. So you go, and you find... I guess someone considers it a building. Uh, probably homeless people and, you know, cockroaches, but, you know, hey, it'll do for now. 
And uh, you have to take over your uncle's... Uh, we'll classify that as a shop. Uh, and, oh yeah, pay off his one million dollar gold debt. Because, you know, he's a nice person. Uh, if you fail to deliver on it, well, you get to be chained up and used as a common worker for ever, really, uh, whenever the company decides you've paid off the debt and no one gets to tell them when that is. So, hey, <laughs> fun. <laughs> so, you you are brand new in this town. You have no money and you owe a significant sum. And, oh, oh yeah, you're a beginner at making potions. So, you're just in the Best place you can be. Mm hmm. And uh, yeah, so that is the uh, the majority of the story of this game. You have to pay off uh, the shop or be turned uh, basically into a slave forever. Uh, to do this, you make potions. Uh, every potion requires different ingredients and requires a different amount of time. To actually be made, the amount of time you have in a day is split into segments. I think there's four segments in a day, I believe. And after you're done making potions, you have to turn around and then sell them. At this point, the game is completely turned into another tire, entire type of game. It turns into a collectible card game. You have to make people... Uh, more interested in the product while trying to deal with the stress that they're going to be giving you uh, uh, and uh, dealing with how much patience they have. Because it doesn't matter how golden your tongue is if the person isn't willing to listen to your bullshit. So you get cards that are like, oh, draw an extra card. It takes, you know, one patience away. Uh, and the person loses one patience, but you get to draw some cards that you get to use and increase the size of your deck so you can use more in the single turn. Uh, every turn, the person loses a various amount of patience based on a multitude of different things that I don't fully comprehend all of, to be honest. Uh and, and yeah, you're just trying to increase the price of the potion as much as you possibly can so you can make some money. Because uh, you, you got to make a lot of it and you got to do it real everything quick. everything around me. Cream, get the money. Dollar, dollar, bill. Sorry, Wu-Tang's for the children. <laughs> yeah, because uh, oh. you have to pay, pay off a part <laughs> of this, I think, every 10 days. So good luck. Uh, you do have one benefit to this. Uh, there is a competition that just happens to be going on uh, in the city where potion makers go against each other and they make certain potions and then try to sell them to the test taker or exam taker, whatever it is, uh, to get points. Whoever wins gets crowned the victor. And there's three of these, I believe it was. And if you win the grand prize, you get one million gold. And that's the only way in hell you're ever going to get enough money. Uh, <laughs> you basically have to win that to beat the game. Yeah, yeah, that 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 is the uh, game beating thing. Uh, the game, I think, lasts. 50 days in total, I think. Um, and then it's game over uh, with you hopefully winning. I mean, it, it can be game over earlier if you suck at the game. Uh, but there are multiple difficulties to the game, so you can make it much easier, which is what I did, because there's no difficulty-based achievements. Uh, which That's good. Yeah, it makes life a lot easier, and it's still not easy. Uh, at that point, but it's a lot easier. Um, there is also a really fun mechanic where certain people that come in, you can get to know them as individuals instead of just as customers and become friends with them. And the more friendly you are with this person, 
it raises uh, an affection level with them, and every level it goes up, they give you an extra card that you can use in the haggling process. Um, and there's a multitude of different cards. Everyone has their own specialty stuff. Uh, and uh, while you're doing this, you can also romance them. And there's a fantastic little option in the settings to allow you to be polyamorous as well, which obviously I turned on because there are a number of really cute girls in this. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm am, I am I shocked by that news. I know, right? <laughs> And, and, and yeah, so uh, you get to uh, get to know these people. You can give them gifts, which costs money. Uh, good luck with that, because money is a, a premium in this place. Uh, and yeah, 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 it's real fun. It's super cute. I love the art style, and some of the girls are uh, very kissable. So <laughs> I approve. All right, well, let's talk price. 30 bucks on this one. What do you think of it? I think that's a pretty decent price, because uh, uh, not everyone's going to just choose polyamory and romance literally everyone in the game, because I, <laughs> you can. There are guys in the game, too, for anyone who's like, I want to romance a guy. There are plenty of guys you can romance as well. Um, they're just not what I'm focusing on. Uh, so there is plenty of replay value, especially if you're only like, I just want to be monogamous uh, every playthrough or whatever. So uh, there, there's plenty you can do in this, and with the multiple difficulties making it significantly harder, uh, I, I think this has plenty of time for the money. Cool. All right. Should we talk about some horror games since it's Halloween? Yeah. I mean, yeah. owing a million gold is is a horror game, as far as I'm concerned. That's a bit too real, though. Fair. Owing, owing money just hits home a bit too hard. Uh, next game, Phasmophobia, developed and published by Kinetic Games, released October 29th on Xbox Series X and S and PS5 for $19.99. Phasmophobia is a four-player online co-op psychological horror. Paranormal activity is on the rise, and it's up to you and your team to use all the ghost hunting equipment at your disposal in order to gather as much evidence as you can. Bree, what is happening in Phasmophobia? So up until now, I had only dabbled in Phasmophobia on Steam because I didn't have as many people to play with over there. The good news is the game is now on consoles and it's cross-platform and that opens my options up a lot. Um, it's a four-player co-op, but you can play by yourself. I think it's much more fun with friends. Another thing to note up front is that this game is still in game preview, so there are going to be some wrinkles to be ironed out still. Um, so yeah, if somehow you've not heard of this game before, it's a ghost hunting game where you form a team of hunters trying to explore the paranormal activity that's on the rise. You go to different locations, use a bunch of different equipment to determine what ghost is haunting the location so you can properly address it. And then uh, when you take a contract, you need to find up to three types of evidence to discern what the ghost type is. The game has a lot of nuance to it, like... With lots of things to gamify the ghost hunting experience, there's tutorial that helps you understand the basics, but I feel like the, most of the game is learned best by doing and failing a lot. Um, my first couple <laughs> solo missions, I ended up dying to a demon and something else. I also managed to get myself locked in a closet. Um, you can do that? Just get locked in a closet? <laughs> I'll explain that a little further later. Oh, God. Um, there, there are 13 different maps available, varying sizes. There's some houses, there's a prison, a campsite, a high school, to name a few. Um, you may have to get to a certain level to unlock some of the maps, or you may you can join lobbies of people who have them unlocked. So, like, if you're only level 5 or, you know, 50 or whatever, and you don't have everything unlocked, you can still play on your friend's maps or whatever that they have unlocked all the stuff. Um, the maps have different effects on them too, like sanity drain, money and experience bonuses. Um, there are also five difficulty ranks from amateur up to insanity for you to play on. When you start a new game, uh, you have just like starter equipment. You can have three held items and you can cycle through them. You can also just drop things on the ground to be used, like, um a notepad for spirit writing or, you know, stuff like that. You can just, you can drop your flashlight on the ground and leave it on. That's also a, a nice tactic you can use. Uh, sometimes the tools are in the house already, like a spirit board. You can ask some questions too, but uh, it's like a cursed item. 
So um, there's like pre-programmed questions you can ask to get easy answers, like where the ghost is. But uh, because it's cursed, it'll use up your sanity. Um, once you get into the game, you want to find out what the ghost's favorite room is first by observing flickering lights, moving objects, things like that. You want to use your equipment to find evidence to make a deduction about what type of entity you're dealing with. Um, once the team agrees on a spirit type, you can enter the truck and leave, and you'll gain XP and money based on how well you do. There are seven types of evidence. So there's freezing temps, EMF, UV footprints, there's dots projector, ghost orbs, ghost writing, and a spirit box, like the EVP, electronic voice phenomena. Um, each of these evidence has a piece of equipment associated with it. And when you find a piece of equipment, you mark things in your journal and check your different types of ghosts. They all have strengths and weaknesses, like uh, some of the ghosts can't be tracked by footprints or don't like salt. If it's a wraith, you might need uh, EMF, spirit box, and dots projector evidence. Um, if you find one piece of evidence and you know the types well, you can preemptively bring out a piece of equipment and rule out or prove your hypothesis on what the ghost is. If you use your journal to record evidence, the tab uh, will actually highlight all your possible ghost types. So if you like click on one type of evidence, it'll it'll narrow down your your list a lot. And then when you click on two types, it'll show you well there's only two types of ghosts that it could be. But there are 20 different 24 different types of ghosts to find, so you have a lot of variation in your contracts. Um, as I mentioned, you get some basic starter equipment that's always available to find your evidence. But you can purchase other things like sanity meds and better equipment from the shop before you leave on a contract. The equipment gets used up or disappears if you fail the contract and die. So you're going to need money. Um, there are daily and weekly tasks you can do to help make money, uh, like play on specific maps, take photos of ghosts, uh, complete specific objectives using a crucifix or, you know, just all sorts of different things like that that you can do for money. Um, in addition to just playing the missions themselves. I kind of have mentioned this already, but you need to watch out for your sanity. Things like ghost events or standing around in the dark too long can hinder your sanity. Thankfully, there's medications you can drink to raise your level back up. Uh, staying in the light is harder than it sounds. You can turn lights off and on, but if you turn on too many lights, the fuse box will trip and turn off everything in the house. And then you got to go find the fuse box and turn it back on while staying safe and sane. Um, and if your sanity drops too low, you may be susceptible to ghosts hunting you. Um, and who the fuck wired the that whole... house that like too many lights will just trip the breaker? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's it's all the houses. It's it's, it's again, it's a gamification that's a pretty cool mechanic. I think that's um, just poor electrician work. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, fair. To to be fair, anytime my washing machine's running, my le- my lights flicker, so you know. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I'm amazed um, we don't trip the breaker with how much shit I have hooked up in my room. But anyway, phasmophobia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so multiplayer matchmaking works really easily. You can choose a region. You can make private rooms. You can host a room. Um, I jumped to some public lobbies where I ran into some experienced players who helped me through a couple of contracts. Uh, nice. Again, it has cross-platform play. So I think I was in a lobby at one point with an Xbox, a PC, and a PlayStation player at once. Um, and it actually will tell you the population playing right now on your server region. Um, so, like, I, I think there was 50,000 people playing at one point on wow. on the North America server when I was doing some public lobbies. So, I mean, yeah. It's got a player playing, base. <laughs> it does. It definitely does. Uh, playing solo is rough. Uh, if you die, it's game over. In multiplayer, if you die, you become a ghost. And the house is all foggy, and you can mess with things to help your to help tell your teammates like what kind of ghost it is. But your mic gets turned off, which is really cool. Um, there are also events like uh, currently they have a blood moon event where you get special things happening, special house special bonuses in for doing certain things in the houses. Um, you mentioned uh, if you die, it turns your mic off. Is this a game that blocks you from being in parties? Um, I. Th- think you can still be in a party because um, you can do private stuff. I didn't test that to the fullest um, uh, because I I was playing before launch. I didn't have people to play with that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I could test some of those things out. But uh, I when you when you launch into the lobby um, and it's I think you have the option for like push to talk or, you know, just auto mic on. Um, 
but yeah, so when you, when you start into the lobby bef- before you actually ready up, uh, as you're pulling people in, you can start talking to them and get a feel for who they are if you're in public lobbies, which was pretty nice. And, you know, people were pretty chit-chatty and, like, helpful. Like, it, I thought it was a really helpful community, too, which was which was good. Um, there was some other good accessibility things, like aim sensitivity, inverted axis, uh, for those people who are on Team Invert. Uh, and Yay. some button mapping, which was something I may need to fiddle with later because I kept accidentally dropping items when I meant to crouch or something. <laughs> um, and accidentally dropping your flashlight off in a dark house after you turn it off by mistake is a surefire way to get locked in a closet. Just just letting you know. <laughs> um, a couple of negative notes. Things like doors are hard to open. Not, not just the getting locked in the closet part, but... Uh, Especially yeah, closet that. doors, apparently. <laughs> yeah, apparently closet doors. Uh, no, they're just they're kind of fiddly. Um, the cursor works fine, but you can tell the game was built with PC in mind, and there's a good reason why the console port was probably delayed. Um, character models are a little goofy at times. You wouldn't notice in Solo because it's first-person view, but it's kind of comical to watch these like stooped characters waddling around. Uh, the control scheme is a bit weird to get used to on console. Again, console was not maybe in the original design plan, but you can remap some of the buttons, or you can just get used to them the way that they are, which, you know, that's an option as well. I think, uh, I think I'm going to need some combination of a couple different button presses and, uh, maybe just some getting used to it. Um, a couple things to note on console. The devs included 60 FPS and up to 4K resolution. Yay! Yay! Uh, at launch, there is sound recognition but not voice recognition, meaning the ghosts can hear you, but they can't understand you. So walking around calling the ghost's name is not as useful on console right now. Um, but they look to add that in the future. Is, is that something that's on PC? Yes, this is available on Steam. Uh, and and that, that feature is available on the Steam version. Ooh. Yeah, you can be like you can find out the ghost's name, like Marta or whatever, and you can walk around saying, Marta, show us yourself or whatever and, and it'll or you can you can say goofy things to piss the ghost off. Um but yeah, you can you can talk to the ghosts and try and encourage them to come out. It's pretty cool. Um you can also turn off the crossplay if that's something you want to do, just just to note. But uh but yeah, I really like this game. The achievement list is a little grindy, but the replayability is high because you have lots of variations and really something that's best played with friends, in my opinion. I would also recommend headphones for good creepy experience. They did a good job with like the little creaking noises and directional audio uh, so you can find your ghost. But yeah, it's good fun. Oh, well, it clocks in at 20 bucks. Uh, as we mentioned, it is on game preview right now, so it can change as the time comes. Uh, what are your thoughts on Phasmophobia at 20? I think that price is great. Um, again, there's a lot of replayability. Um, you can play it solo. You can play it with friends. You've got public lobbies options. Um, and with the crossplay, like it's a huge player base you have available to you. So yeah, I would say definitely, uh, check it out. It's, uh, it's also entertaining just to like, you know, listen to your, your friends, Mike skit cut if they're <laughs> screaming when they get caught by the ghost uh, and just like ah yeah that's that's always good fun cool any I have other a thoughts f- on it oh go ahead I have, a f- I have a feeling that if we got Pernell to play this he would have some of the funniest things to say <laughs> while playing <laughs> yeah Oh, all right, let's move on. Another horror game, Fear the Spotlight, developed by Cozy Game Pals, published by Blumhouse Games, released October 22nd on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, PS4, PS5, PC. For $19.99, Fear the Spotlight is an atmospheric third-person horror adventure with a disturbing mystery to unravel, sneak into school after hours with Vivian and Amy, survive a seance gone wrong, solve tactical puzzles, and whatever you do, stay out of the spotlight. Bree, what is Fear the Spotlight? So this is a game I have had my eye on since it was first announced and uh, was uh, not disappointed. This is a story about two friends. Amy's kind of punk and can pick locks. Viv is a bookworm with an inhaler. Both characters have voice acting. Um, They break into a lobby or a library to borrow a spirit board from a fall occult display. 
in a high school, which is totally not a recipe for disaster. Um, and we find out that Amy has been feeling followed by a spirit and has an old burned rose that appeared in her locker. We also learn that there was a fire that killed a dozen or so students back in the 90s. Uh, maybe, maybe some connections there. Amy performs uh, the seance and asks the spirits to speak through the board and they talk back. And then Amy's abducted by some bright light and everything seems to be on fire and then Vivian needs to run and then things get really weird really fast and the school no longer looks like it did before and the pages we're finding on the floor are dated 1991. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the, the general premise of the story. You get uh, more of the story through notes and other things in the environment. We learned that back in the 90s there was a school play going on for Phantom of the Opera and the rich girl Heather is totally going to get the lead for the the play out of popularity and bullying, not because she's the best. The so-called weird girl Chrissy is also trying out, despite all the bullying, because she's hoping to get closer to Raul, who gets the male lead. But Chrissy also has a mysterious secret admirer who's sending her roses and letters. And then the students are having accidents, and Raul goes missing, and Chrissy gets the lead, and it's it's a whole it's a whole big thing. But perhaps like in most ghost ghost stories, you uh, you need to resolve the drama of the past to save Amy and get back to the present. That's 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 where I'll leave the the plot, so I don't spoil it for anybody. Um, gameplay is a little running and sneaking, and generally exploring. It's third person 3D exploration with uh, like a low-poly, kind of 90s retro vibe to the graphics. You can inspect things in the environment that gleam. You can put things in your inventory. You can, um, you can also like touch items. Sorry, like couldn't read my notes. <laughs> um, you can touch an item that needs something like a key, and it'll automatically break up your inventory. So you can choose from what you have, which I thought was really nice. You're not always like walking up and, and having to then realize you need something and then go out and find your inventory and bring the item back. It just like automatically pops it up, which I thought was neat. If you don't have anything that'll work though, it'll give you a little clue that you need to find something like a type of key or a type of tool or something, which I thought was also really nice. You may need to use tools to open things like pliers or a screwdriver. Um, there are some puzzles to solve, number of combinations to find. Puzzles happen in point-and-click style mode. One of the earlier puzzles involves you finding a number of fuses that you'll gain access to through various tools and exploration, and then you need to puzzle your way through setting up the box to open several doors. It was a pretty involved puzzle with three different stages. Like, I was actually a little worried at first I wasn't going to get it, and then I figured it out, and I was really proud of myself. <laughs> I'm proud of um, you, too. Yay! Uh, both puzzles and tools are very tactile. You have to unzip bags. You have to oh, physically open the doors, or, like flip little latches on things. You use a jack to lift heavy objects. Uh, you get to fiddle with wires and fuses to get the electric back on. The game is designed to be accessible to a younger audience. It's inspired by teen horror. There aren't any jump scares in the game. Uh, it really focuses on the tense and creepy environment for its horror instead. Doors uh, open and close on their own. There are some liminal space horror vibes at times, and we'll see things out of the corner of our eye. The spatial audio has creaks and groans to set the mood and alert us to things going on, like the appearance of the spotlight monster. Because the title is Fear the Spotlight, uh, there's this kind of humanoid monster with a theater spotlight for a head. Sometimes the spotlight just appears out of the ceiling and you have to dodge it or get burned. But when the monster shows up, you have to hide, sneak, or run to save yourself. You can't fight back. There's no way to do it. Uh, you have to be mindful of your breath with an inhaler. If you take damage from the spotlight, Vivian has trouble breathing. If you get hit enough times, then it's game over. Inhalers are single-use items you find when exploring the school. You can run around with damage on you. But if the screen flashes, like the screen will flash red at you, um, it's kind of annoying. And then you only get so many hits. Um, you can check how damaged you are in the menu. 
There's also an achievement for getting through the game without damage, and one for not using inhalers. Uh, so that's fun. Uh, yeah, uh, it's doable. It's doable. Um, accessibility rough, options available for Team Invert again. Um, you can change the frame rate between retro and smooth. I actually ended up liking the smooth option. There is a TV filter and some wobble sliders. Um... You can turn off clue highlights, so if you don't want the game to hold your hand, you can turn that off and figure things out on your own. Uh, what if I do want the game to hold my hand? Ooh. Like, what if I want to have a relationship with the game? <laughs> I mean... Jacob, you should have said your joke in here instead of in chat. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, obviously, for posterity... Uh, I wrote that it's weird that the lights get you in the school and not the asbestos and black mold. Oh, yeah. <laughs> True story. Um, but yeah, you can remap controls if you need to. The game auto saves, which is nice. Um, this game was made by a husband and wife team and published by a new games division of a horror film company, which I think is is pretty cool. Like, I've really enjoyed this one so far. The nostalgia vibe is really great in terms of the cinematic presentation of the story and the game elements and visual style reminiscent of the late 90s. Uh, the story kept me wanting to know more and uncover the mystery drama of the drama students from the past and who the real villain is in this piece. Uh, there are some places where either the story or the gameplay was kind of predictable to me, but I would say that's in part that I play a lot of games and I'm familiar with some of the inspirations for the game and the story. Um, but yeah, if you enjoy some classic horror puzzles, puzzle games, you might enjoy this. More modern example I could compare this to is something like Guilt. Uh, if you like spooky but you don't want the jump scares, this is a good one to take a look at. If you, uh, I mean, they just, they did a good job of creating tension with lighting and sound. The puzzles were interesting. I don't want to give too much away, but just when you think the game is over, there's actually more game to enjoy, which was pretty cool. Ooh. Yeah. Well, don't don't spoil too much, but the game costs 20 bucks. What are your thoughts on Fear the Spotlight? I think that is a great price for this as well. I would say buy it. Cool beans. All right, let's uh, do our horror trilogy with Clock Tower Rewind. Developed and published by WayForward and Limited Run Games. Released October 29th on Series X and S, Switch, PS4, PS5, and PC for $19.99. Clock Tower Rewind is a revival of the terror-inducing 16-bit classic that dares you to explore the haunting confines of the Barrows family manor. As teenage orphan Jennifer, you must search every disturbing corner to find items, reveal secrets, and discover ways to evade Scissor Man, a murderous, unstoppable, shears-wielding psychopath. Sounds cute. Bree, what's going on in Clock Tower Rewind? So this is a point-and-click stealth horror game where you're running and hiding from the Scissor Man. Jennifer Simpson, who my mother swears look a looks like Jennifer Connelly, is trapped in a Norwegian mansion and must escape the horrors of the Scissor Man. The game concept and story is inspired by Italian film director Dario Argento, specifically the film Phenomenon, known in the, in the U.S. as Creepers, and it stars Jennifer Connelly. So my mother Aww. turned out to be right. Uh, and I got that confirmation from, from a dev interview that, in fact, uh, it is supposed to look like Jennifer Connelly because that is the inspiration for the main character. So uh, the story is that Jennifer and a couple other girls from the orphanage have been adopted by the Barrows family. The Barrows own a mansion with an enormous clock tower. They go to the mansion and things are taking too long, so Jennifer goes in the other room to check on things and she hears a blood-curdling scream from one of the other kids. And you go back and check and everyone is gone. And now you've got to run for your life and find your way out. But the main door is locked. So are several other doors in the house. And you've got to just open doors and check behind things and hope that you eventually find your way out. Um, Clock Tower Rewind allows you to play the original 16-bit as well as the new Rewind mode. The original game released in 1995 on Super Famicom. 
And that's that's a long time ago. That is. And it's considered to be a cult classic uh, survival horror game. Uh, it has been officially translated and released out of Japan for the first time ever. Um, so I'm sure there are, are, are other versions of it out there, but this is the first like official. They they did something. The original creators did something. Not you know someone homebrewed uh, a translation and put it out there illegally. There you go. <laughs> uh, the sequel, just called Clock Tower, also was localized outside of Japan in 1996 and ported to PlayStation, and then it had some sequels. So, for those of you who remember playing Clock Tower on PlayStation in, say, you know, Europe or the U.S., uh, it was called Clock Tower, but it was actually Clock Tower Two. So, it's one of those situations uh. where the Japanese English numbering system is off because they didn't release all the games over here. So, Clock Tower Three is actually the fourth game in the series, as an example. Yeah. So, uh, but it is, it is, so yes, you might have played Clock Tower because they just called it Clock Tower instead of Clock Tower 2, um, but uh, that, that is a sequel. Um, Rewind has some quality of life enhancement, like save states, some restored content from the first Fear edition of Clock Tower. There's also a new motion graphic with voiceover, um, a song, there's a museum of box art and inserts. Uh, motion comics, commercial sample demo uh, in Japanese. It has a music player, which is kind of entertaining because you can just listen to a bird scream, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, over and over again. It's it's fabulous. And uh, there's a Japanese comic and strategy guide and a dev interview, which is a really cool video dev interview with a bunch of different segments in it, which is really cool. Uh, so yeah, just from a game preservation standpoint, this is a fabulous, fabulous collection of features. I did have some struggles with buttons and some of the menus not doing what I expected. Uh, to help you get around, there is a tutorial infographic in the main menu that tells you that the bumpers move the character, X is the interact button, A is the panic button, and so on. Um, you can actually uh, press Y, I think, to stop Jennifer as uh, running uh, causes her to lose her stamina a little bit. So you can forcibly stop her from running. Um, and then, of course, you can move the cursor with the left stick or the D-pad. I don't remember that games didn't come with tutorials as much as they did booklets with button maps and write-ups on how to play. And uh, this was, you know, they kind of preserved that vibe as well. What the game didn't tell me was how to access the new save states uh, menu, or that uh, trigger would start and pause the game, or start and that start would pause the game. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you open the menu with trigger. There we go. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> <sighs> Gameplay is point and click. There are hot spots where you can find with your cursor around each of the rooms where you find items and interact with things. You can select things in your inventory and use them on other objects, like using the car keys with the car, but not until you found your friends. It couldn't be that easy. I found the car and the car keys really early on, and they're like, no, you can't leave the game and win. No, of course not. <laughs> and then I died and uh, had to go back to an earlier save so I could try and, and try again. So the game uh, was right. You can't leave without your friends. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that there's an ending where you like you leave without your friends, but that was not that ending apparently. Um, you can walk around investigating the mansion at your leisure, but if you hear slasher music, you've got to move and hide because that means the scissor man is there. There are a few cases where you can panic and defend yourself, like with a shovel. Um, but for the most part, you need to run and hide. I found the panic button also to be helpful while attempting to hide. I was able to jump over a cabinet. You get uh, flashing on your character when she's starting to panic, and you can just mash that panic button, which is really good. Um, but yeah, the original pixel art was pretty impressive. Also impressive, the game had multiple endings and randomized encounters with the Scissor Man. So, like, that's one of the things they talk about in the dev interview. Um, is that there were these walkthroughs for the game that are like, oh, hey, you know, when the Scissor Man shows up here, 
you just you just do this and this is your little trick and and the devs like no the the scissor man could show up randomly like yes there's a higher probability that it'll show up at certain specific moments like when you walk into the shower and see you know your first dead body okay the scissor man shows up after that but uh other than that it can just show up randomly for for no reason which is pretty cool for a game in 1995 yeah uh you'll naturally also run into some dead ends when you fumble attempting to run away from the villain there's an achievement for finding all the endings the rest of the list seems to reward you for make, making it to certain locations or interacting with specific items. The audio is really well done as far as footsteps and bits of music to raise the tension. Uh, it's a pretty quiet game most of the time. But yeah, if you're like me and you've always wanted to play this, or you appreciate classic games and game preservation, this was a great game to add to your collection. So what was the price on this one again? It, it clocks in at 20 Give us mm. your thoughts on Clock Tower Rewind. I think that is a great price for this as well. Like, I, I would say this is a buy it for me. Cool. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate that Way Forward is doing so much lately between Retro Realms Arcade and Clock Tower. They're mm. just putting so much out lately. But uh, mm-hmm. next up, My Hotel Echoes of the Past, developed by Brain Swapper, published by Creative Forge Games. It released April 17th on Steam as a free to play game. Try it now for free and add to your wish list. Step into 1950s adventure with My Hotel Echoes of the Past. As the new owner of a hotel shrouded in mystery, renovate with style, unravel secrets, and juggle faction intrigues. A captivating blend of history and adventure. Aki, what is going on in My Hotel Echoes of the Past? Okay, so this hotel was owned by your uncle, I think it was? Maybe grandfather. I don't exactly remember. And uh, he kind of got a case of the uh, bullet hole through the head uh, in in the hotel. So uh, no one knows how or who. So it's been 10 years since then, and you've come back to lay claim to this place. You're going to reopen it, you're going to make bank, and you're going to figure out who did what to your uncle and... Uh, I don't know what you're going to do with that information, but you want to find out. <laughs> Your character ain't particularly hardened in any conceivable way. Um, it's like a marshmallow. He's so soft. So, eh. uh, so basically in this game, you take care of the hotel. And part of that is you have to fix up the rooms first and foremost. Uh, they have... Stuff on the walls you have to clean, you have to get furniture to put in them to make them actual rooms so people will stay in them. Because otherwise, there's just shit in a room uh, and no one's going to stay in there because there's no, you know, bed, for instance. (laughs) Uh, and, And yeah, so you have to do that with every room. And you're given a whole slew of items you can put in there. Uh, Sadly, you don't get to buy any of these items. They instead are rewards for doing different quests in the game and the like. So you don't know the value of any of this crap. The problem is there is a value to it because certain ones, you put them in a room and the room's value goes up. But there's nothing that tells you that information. You have to put it in the room, then go down to downstairs into a different room and look and see what it would cost for someone to rent that room now. Uh, And guess what? That takes forever if you're going to try and figure out how much anything you're placing is worth. So don't just don't waste your time. Um, One of the major drawbacks to this game is that right there, uh, because it makes it very hard to figure out how to improve the room to make it worth more money. Um, So you can, again, make bank. Um, Whilst you're doing this, though, there are different groups that you're trying to appease so they don't, I don't know, give you a case of the hole in heads. Uh, You have cops uh, who want to do illegal stuff but don't want to be seen doing illegal stuff, so it's up to you to do the illegal stuff for them and just leave it for them because, you know, 
cops. Uh, then there's also the proper Italian mafia. There's a Russian gang. And then there's a group of prostitutes. Um, uh, you know, great people. Uh, and all of them will, uh, will off you if you piss them off. Uh, so that's, that's fun. That is where the quest mechanic comes in. Every morning you're giving some quests to do that you can do a quest that you can do and it will raise how much one group likes you, but will often make everyone else like you less. Or you can tell that group to fuck off, uh, which will make them hate you uh, the same amount that you would have raised earlier, but make everyone else like you a little more. Some of them you can ignore with minor losses to the group that you would have okayed or told the fuck off. So there's that. Uh, however, you can, in order to offset some of this stuff, you can buy different types of alcohol. And by that, I mean make as much money as you can and buy all the alcohol at all times. Because uh, you can buy them all a certain amount of times and it will raise the affection you have or that that group has with you by a little bit with each one of them you buy. Uh, the problem with this system is that any small insignificant thing can make a group hate you, can wipe out all the progress you've had, 100% of it, for one tiny fuck up. And the game doesn't tell you what's going to happen at any of these times. For instance, I had like 57% uh, affinity with the cops. I rented the room, a uh, room to some Russians. Suddenly the cops fucking hate me. What? No, what? No. And that ha was a lot of my experience with the game was doing something having a lot, uh, a group like me a lot, and then suddenly having them hate me for no reason when everything in the game seems to raise or lower it by no more than, like, seven points. And I would lose, like, 40 to 50 points. Because, uh, uh, so, you know, eh, that mechanic, I, I think, could use some, uh, better fine-tuning, and by that I mean some fine-tuning in some way. Uh, cause that's, that's, that kind of sucks when you're trying, cause you have to keep all of these groups happy, or they will off you. It doesn't matter which group it is, you have to keep them all happy. It's really hard to do that when, you know, not even doing a mission, just renting a room to somebody can make a group suddenly fucking hate you. That's, that kind of sucks. It kind of makes it real hard to keep everyone liking you. Because then you kind of have to just tell everyone, no, you can't stay at the hotel. Because that's the only way you can make sure that they ain't going to do something to piss everyone else off. And if you're doing that, you're not making money. So, eh? uh, there, there's also things like you have to take care of rats and you can buy upgrades. Uh, like you can upgrade the bathrooms to make them look better. I'm pretty sure that's actually supposed to cost money, but... I don't know if it's a glitch or if the game just doesn't have that in it right now, but I was able to upgrade all of them for free, which was fantastic. Uh, there's also, you can upgrade the, the halls of the second floor, which is where all the rooms are, as well as the main lobby, which is on the ground floor where you do everything. Um, you also have to fix rooms and deal with laundry, or else it makes... Uh, the value of the rooms drop, plummet like a rock. Uh, and you're given these tasks a numerous times throughout the day. And there is a little clock at the top that tells you, oh, you're going to get a mission at this time, at this time, at this time. Someone's going to check in at this time. So you kind of know what you're doing in the future. You may not know exactly who's going to check in or what missions you're going to have to do, but you know there's going to be something to do. Yeah. So fixing everything was a timed little mini game that uh, was actually kind of hard because it was a really long one. It was just the A and D buttons, but there was like 
it would switch between them, obviously, as as a game like that does. But it was like 12 of them, and you didn't have very long to do it. So you had to do it quick, and you had to do it accurately. So it was yeah. very difficult. Yeah, I didn't. I I don't. I didn't feel any of them, but I came real close a few times, and they were all very stressful because they required you to do it so fast. You Here, also here's a here's a question I have for you. How far into the game did you get? Because I'm looking at the discussions on Steam, and it looks like someone ran into an issue where they cannot get past day seven. I don't think I past day seven either i i think because i kept... it just breaks somehow oh I... oh yeah yeah for for me i kept getting hated so much that i couldn't keep them liking me long enough <laughs> to get to day seven people hate I, you I... what <laughs> i know right must be uh, your personality your magnetic yeah. personality yeah magnetic to bullets maybe magnetic uh, to razor blades yeah, um, <laughs> I don't. I don't think I made it past like day four or five because uh, everything I did made the people hate me. Even though I was doing everything I could to make them like me, um, you also had to deal with uh, mice invading the place, and the game tells you, "Oh, you'll have to deal with this occasionally." No, you don't. You have to deal with that all day, every day. Oh, God. That <laughs> shit sucks. It's not fun. <laughs> Pain in the ass. Because you might have like 20 rats in one room. And the easiest just way to Just burn it down. It, just burn the hotel down straight. at that point. Great. That many mice, but, just burn it down. But uh, like... You, oh, go ahead. Let, let's, let's get to a verdict on this. Right now, it's just a free-to-play trial. Uh, the they want you to wish list the full game. Is this worth downloading the trial and giving it a go? Is it worth wish listing, ignoring, following? What should people do with my hotel? I, I personally, at this point, with what they what I've seen so far, I I think it's a, a no, an ignore it for me. Maybe if they do some stuff to fix the balancing of some of the issues and get rid of some of the damn rats. <laughs> sure, maybe then it could be like a, a wish list or something, but as it is right now, it, it's an ignore it for me. All right. Well, if it uh, gets any updates, significant updates or anything like that, maybe we will revisit it in the future. Uh, but any other thoughts for now? No, that's about it. All right, next game to talk about is Cute Bite, developed by Hanako Games, published by Rattalaika Games, released October 25th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, PS4, PS5, for $14.99, a vampire-raising sim. What? Train the little mistress in skills so she can bite her way through obstacles. She might hunt criminals for their blood, become a celebrity, and feed on her fans, raise a dark army to threaten the world, or many other possible outcomes. Jacob, what is Cute Bite? So Cute Bite is this, it's kind of like a mixture of like a visual novel and a management sim. Um, and what happens is that you are the uh, servant of this vampire lord. And all of a sudden there's some sort of freak accident and uh, a wall inside his huge mansion collapses and poof. Oh my God. All of a sudden, uh, he got exposed to sunlight and collapses into dust. And you're just like, crap. Uh, well, he's been keeping me alive for all these years. So I'm going to need a vampire to, uh, help keep me alive. And you recall that, the, uh, this vampire Lord had a daughter who was apparently very naughty and annoyed him so much that he was just like, yo, I'm going to put you in a coffin and seal you up and uh, I'll wake you when I feel like it, which Every was apparently like the word naughty. I think a fable in naughty, naughty, so naughty, naughty. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so he's just like, yeah, I'm going to send you away because I don't feel like dealing with you. Uh, so you wake her up and she is, she's like hundreds of years old, but of course, like she's got the mind of a kid because that's when she got sealed up. So she's like 17, 18 ish. Um, and she's essentially a blank slate. Uh, she doesn't remember anything about her past. And she's very curious about the world that uh, 
that is now around her. And so it's your job as the servant to take care of her and instruct her, like find instruction uh, for all these different kinds of subjects and jobs that she can do. So hopefully in a year, uh, within a year's time, she'll be able to not, not like move out on her own, but be self-sufficient in the world and decide what kind of vampire that she wants to be. And I'm not going to lie. It's an, it's an interest. It's a more interesting premise than I found it to be interesting gameplay wise. Um, so you start out with X amount of money and you can hire these tutors to help t- uh, like to get her started uh, with these subjects that she has to learn. And, but at the same time, your money's also eventually going to run out. So you, she has to start taking a job and you have to keep balancing uh, her mental health, her physical health, and also the money that's coming in. Uh, and so like classes, like will take away some of the mental, like, you know, uh, she'll be become really tired and mentally fatigued. Uh, whereas working, depending on the type of job, she might become physically fatigued. Like if she's like a grocery store stock person, uh, or if she's like a library aide, um, and there are a lot of choices as to like what direction that she can go in. Um, and yeah, and at the same time, she also has to learn how to become a proper vampire, which is involved with like drinking blood, uh, attacking random people at night. Uh, it, there's a lot to it. Um, and then the game doesn't even like mention that this is a possibility. And the only reason why I found out was because the achievements you can actually romance some of the teachers or not, not so much you, but the vampire uh, girl, buttercup, she can uh, romance some of her teachers, depending on how far she gets in the lessons, um, like what traits she picks up. And I mean, it's, it's the idea is interesting but I'm not going to lie, the gameplay itself is a bit of a slog. And to add to the confusion, uh, when you do some of your jobs, it doesn't exactly tell you, like, oh, this is how much, like, mental uh, or physical stuff it's going you're going to lose out on or gain. Um, and on top of it, like, if you don't keep practicing certain stuff, you're going to lose those abilities, too. Um, and so if you're studying up like a bunch of stuff for jobs, which is like regular, uh, like studying like law books, history books, stuff like that, instead of like doing karate or (laughs) horseback riding, stuff like that, then you're going to lose out on some of those traits. And it's just, it becomes a lot to balance and it, I'm not going to lie. It kind of (laughs) derides the fun that could be like that could have been had in this game it just ends up becoming a very mixed bag That's unfortunately like it's not like it's definitely not like a terrible game but like it there there's a lot more potential that i wish had been ironed out in this um and maybe not the uh like the ability for your trait levels to go down i wish that wasn't so much of a uh Like, it just didn't hit your character nearly as hard as it does. Um, It it becomes a pretty frustrating experience because you only have 52 weeks to work with. Um, And so, you know, if you're doing X, X kind of job and you're doing karate this week, and also, like, she's trying to feed, so she has to attack, like, somebody, and those fights can also take away uh you know, your physical strength. And it's just, there's a lot to it that kind of ruins the, I don't know, the fun of it. Mm. (laughs) Like it just, it becomes this like stat heavy, like too management heavy, a little too management heavy, but then it's also too random with like how it, like how stuff really gets accomplished. And the fact that the game doesn't really advertise like, this is how like you can romance people. This is how like you can get X, Y, Z ending. Like, I'm not saying like, you know, I want everything spelled out for me, 
with this game, but like if you go in there without a without any kind of guide, like you're gonna get hundreds of hours of gameplay out of this game unintentionally trying to complete it. And it's just it's frustrating. Well, we should talk price on it. It's fourteen ninety nine. Does cute bite be cute or does cute bite bite? I'd I'd give it a try it. Like, as I said, like, it's not terrible. It's just there's a lot going on. And if you are really into management stuff, more so than visual novel, then this might be up your alley more so. But um, if you were looking for, like, a simple, cute visual novel, this this is not going to be your bag. Sounds good. All right. Well, we have sent uh, Aki away because it's Kids Corner time. So it's just us, Jacob. You ready? You ready to talk kids games? I am ready to talk kids games. All right, George, hit it. Kids Corner! With Jacob and friends! God, I love that intro. Uh, first up, Smurfs Dreams, developed by Ocella Studio, published by Microids, released October 24th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, PS4, PS5 for $39.99. Gargamel has devised a new evil scheme to catch the Smurfs. He's cast a cunning curse on the sarsaparilla bushes, causing a deep slumber across the Smurfs after they eat the delicious leaves. Embark on a dreamlike quest to awaken all the Smurfs before the evil Gargamel reaches the village. In the dream world, anything is possible, and excitement can quickly turn into a nightmare. Jacob, what is Smurfs Dreams? So Smurfs Dreams introdu- like is not uh, let me let me preface this. If you were expecting a game like the two previous action adventure Smurfs games where it was more of like a uh, Mario Sunshine uh, kind of title, this is not it. Okay, do not go in there expecting this. This is very much a uh, 3D platformer game. And in this, uh, Gargamel has, like, is, like, it's not so much poison, but, like, he's put all of the Smurfs to sleep. And somehow you missed it, and now you have to go save everyone. And by doing that, you are going into these dreams of the various Smurfs, and essentially you're just getting from point A to point B, and you're going to wake them up. Um, and each of the Smurfs has, like, a different... Uh, I don't want to say biome, but like kind of like level design. Um, And so it's all based on their personality or their jobs. And it's really beautiful to look at. I will give it that. Um, And the levels are set up pretty nicely, but uh, like (laughs) it's, it gets frustrating real quick because it is not exactly the easiest to take out these enemies. Um, and because you're dealing with the environment that's around you and these are basic platforming things like, you know, uh, there's various blocks that are along in the water. And first off, they like, I mean, they'll look like cakes or, um, or just like regular rocks, like whatever. It depends on like what the level is and the level design for this. It is beautiful. Like this is really well done. It's, it's gorgeous to look at. Um, but the amount of time that the game gives you for, uh, for messing up, like, thankfully there are no continues because the game's just like, up oh, back to the last checkpoint, but getting rid of some of these enemies, uh, with the camera that this game has, it's just, it is really frustrating real quick. I, I don't know that kids are going to be as much of a fan of this as adults, um, cause they definitely ramp up the difficulty, uh, in it. And that's not to say that it's a particularly difficult game, but I don't think that kids are going to be able to, uh, there's some points in like the levels where I don't know that kids are exactly going to be able to navigate and they might have to have a parent or older sibling step in. Um, but uh, as you go through these levels, there's also little bonus areas that you can uh, enter and unlock, and that gives you more stuff to collect uh, and look at and help other Smurfs, which will unlock other achievements in the game. But the real pain in the butt with this game is the boss battles, 
And thankfully, there are checkpoints during the boss battles because you will need them. No, um, right. Yeah, the bosses are just... They are a bear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, especially... Um, oh, shoot. What's his name? I think it's like Big Mouth or something like that. He's this guy who just like swallows these like random flames and then just starts shooting them at you. Um, and also some of these flames will start following you and you just have to like you have to dodge that while dodging the stuff that's coming down on top of you like it almost feels like an old nes game turned into a 3d game it's like that kind of like platformer difficulty um but as i said it's a far it's a far more generous game than i was expecting uh in terms of just reset uh, like putting you back at the checkpoint thankfully um so yeah, so that being said, like it is a shorter game that I would have liked. Um like the levels, I mean, there's there's a decent amount of levels to it. However, you're really go only going after a small amount of smurfs to wake everyone else up. And so you kind of end up feeling like you want more to it or wish that there was more to it. Yeah. Um but I mean, it's not like don't get me wrong. It's not a bad game. It's just, it's radically different from the ones that we've played before. And it's a little more frustrating, uh, than I think the target audience is going to be okay with. Uh, I see it has local multiplayer. Did you have a chance to play with your kids and all, or do you think this is a bit outside of their skill level based on the difficulty that you're talking about? Uh, I didn't get a chance to play with them on it. Uh, but, I can, I know my, like, I know my kids and they would have been like, <laughs> forget this. We're just going to have dad beat all the levels and then we'll go back and, you know, <laughs> run around. <laughs> like, uh, this is, yeah. Even though my kids are 10 and seven, I think they just, they would just skip this one, unfortunately, and go play the previous Smurfs games. Mm. Well, it's a bummer to hear, but we gotta we gotta talk price and verdict on it. It's forty bucks. What do you think of Smurfs Dreams? For forty bucks, I honestly think it is worth it, and it's not a bad game. It's just I think it's it's a bit more challenging than the target demographic that they're gonna go for this game. Um, and at the same time, like the kids who would be pretty good at this, or people who would be pretty good with this are not the target demographic for <laughs> for this game. Um, so it, it's a weird catch-22 on this. Um, at the same time, the local co-op would probably make it so a parent can, like, drag their kid through the level and uh, the boss fights. So, you know, if you're willing to sit with your kid on this, uh, or if you've got a parent who's willing to sit with you on this, then yeah, definitely. Um but this isn't like some game I would give as like a random gift to a kid. Gotcha. All right. Next up, Miraculous Paris Under Siege, develop, uh, developed by Petite Fabrique, published by Game Mill Entertainment, released October 25th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, PS4, PS5, and PC for $49.99. Step into the suits of Ladybug and Cat Noir in the most daring adventure yet. Embark on a thrilling adventure where heroism, acrobatic combat, and parkour agility collide. A shadow moth unleashes a wave of villains across the city. It's up to you and your friends to save Paris. Jacob, what is Miraculous? Paris under siege. Miraculous, simply the best, up to the test when things go wrong. Have you ever seen it? I have not. It's actually not a bad show. Uh, my youngest is really into it, which is why I was like, oh, yeah, I'll definitely take this game for a review because um, they'll go nuts. But you just want to sing the theme. Don't lie. I was, I was originally going to interrupt you on it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, <laughs> so the premise is that it's this teenage girl who uh, gets the powers of the, like the Akuma. Unfortunately, not Street Fighter uh akuma but these like little like almost like charms or whatever uh and each person has one or like each main character i should say of this uh of the heroes has one and she turns into this hero called ladybug um and 
she uh, she has to balance life as a teenager and as a superhero meanwhile there's this other guy named cat noir who she has a crush on both as a hero and as like his alter ego but they don't know uh that you know who is who and stuff like that and so like especially if you go online like there's all sorts of shipping with this thing even though like obviously like they're supposed to become romantically uh involved anywho it's actually not a bad show i'd recommend checking it out (laughs) um (laughs) i've had to watch a lot of it with my kids so that's why (laughs) that's why i I can tell i can tell (laughs) um so yeah so uh in this one paris believe it or not is under siege what and Yup. And all these supervillains are causing all this chaos all over Paris. And it has made Paris almost become a ghost town in some areas. Uh, and it's up to you to stop these villains and restore Paris to like the vibrant city that it normally is. And what happens is that, uh, Marionette, who is the girl, uh, the main hero of the story her friend like a bunch of her friends all get sucked up into this and so not only do you have to stop like the big bad of this but you also have to go free your friends um and it's really just you running from point a to point b and the game does not properly tell you what like what's going to harm you and what's not there's a lot of trial and error and thankfully the game like doesn't have like any game overs you just start back at the last checkpoint um but it could get real frustrating real quick as like how quickly your life depletes and thankfully there are food items all over paris that you can pick up or you can hit up a vending machine and uh get uh your health back uh so the fights aren't nearly as terrible and you do have powers that you can upgrade like you I mean you can upgrade your health your strength like all that kind of stuff and that's fine um but the action is really what we're here for and i will say that frequently the action is pretty cool it's almost like spider-man ish levels of just like whipping around and like you know beating up all the are you there hello what happened (laughs) uh i got some sort of political phone call and i didn't realize it disabled my mic um okay so where did i leave off at i have no clue (laughs) you're just Um, talking and then boot disappeared okay so you weren't you weren't even listening to me why would i listen to you I mean, that's, that's fair. Yeah. Okay. So the action is very Spider-Man esque and you, uh, you're whipping around and just like, it's very fluid action. Um, as you're punching and kicking, uh, your way through the streets of Paris against all of these different villains, which, uh, are all based on whatever superhero of the area that you're battling. And so like, there's this one that's called Wi-Fi girl or something like that. Um, and so all of your enemies are like these TVs or smartphone, like huge looking things along with some robots that you're going to see everywhere. Um, and you really have to plan out your, I mean, you don't really have to, I mean, you can really just punch everything in sight. Um, that's fair, but it, but it really does help like to try to get around and like punch them from the back because a lot of the times, uh, you know, it, it takes time for them to react and turn around and all that kind of stuff. But that being said, the enemy AI is like aliens, uh, uh, colonial Marines kind of style where it's just like, you can be five feet next to them and they're just like, Oh, I don't, I don't know what's around. Oh, I'm just going to keep walking. Like they will not notice you unless you are literally in front of them. Or they'll spot you from 40 feet away and just like start firing stuff at you that all of a sudden (laughs) you have to dodge. It is like, it just doesn't make sense. And 
pair that with levels where it's like it doesn't exactly tell you what's going to harm you and what's not i mean obviously the electricity on the ground is going to harm you and it does make you restart from uh the previous checkpoint but it's just it it gets it can get real frustrating with it and on top of it uh paris has suddenly become like the land of shipping containers because they are everywhere in this city and it's just there's just miles of shipping containers and i know it's because they didn't want to render certain stuff but certain levels are just (laughs) like they just don't look good which is really unfortunate like and i'm not expecting like you know assassin's creed brotherhood out of this um (laughs) even though like even though like uh notre dame even though you are right there are you really are no no no, i'm not (laughs) but like but the thing is is that it's just like it i don't i don't want to call it sloppy but it's just it's uninspired and it's just there's not like some of the levels are really cool to look at like there's one where you have to like constantly hop uh between trains as you're beating up all these uh bad guy robot things and that's really cool but then again then you have like part of a level where it's like thousands of shipping containers like i know paris does not have this many uh (laughs) like just walled up on one side of the city like it's no that's not happening um and it's just between that like between uninspired level design and uh, a camera that is frequently wonky it it can create a pretty frustrating experience um that being said my kid who is a huge fan of the show was just like heck yeah man new miraculous <laughs> game i'm all for this as an adult playing it myself who has played better games than this i, I like i'm constantly frustrated with it like there's one like from one minute i could be like oh man this is really cool and the other minute i'm like what the heck this thing is so janky like (sighs) yeah i guess i guess being a kid has the benefit of not being as picky when it comes to tech issues or design issues well i think it's i think also kids are more willing to just accept it and be like oh yeah i'm playing a miraculous game yeah like yeah. Uh, than adults i mean <sighs> you know i mean it was like with spider-man games like you could have like the current spider-man games that we have now or you could have spider-man friend ver- uh friend versus foe or whatever the heck that thing was back on the 360 you know um it quality varies on yeah. this kind of stuff well, let's talk price on it. It's a $50 game. It also has a deluxe edition available that includes uh, some bonus costumes and stuff for 60 bucks. What are your thoughts on Miraculous Paris Under Siege? If you or your kid are huge fans of Miraculous, then yeah, this is an automatic buy. Um, it's solid enough to definitely keep your kids entertained. But if you're an adult who's just looking for some random game to play, this is a definite wait for a sale. Sounds good. All right. Well, we've got one final game to talk about on this episode, and that is Like a Dragon Project Friendship. I mean, Barbie Project Friendship, developed by Zaloc Studios and Casual Brothers, published by Outright Games, released October 25th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, PS4, PS5, and PC for $39.99. Get ready for the ultimate Barbie gaming adventure as Barbie and Barbie work together as Barbie and Barbie work together to save a beloved yes. mount. Huh? Yeah, it is Barbie and Barbie. Okay. The Malibu Waves Community Center. Join them and their friends on a fun adventure to transform six spaces into fabulous spots like the pet salon, campsite, tech lab, and more. Jacob, you said this is your favorite Yakuza game, so tell me about it. <laughs> well, initially it was. Unfortunately, it has gone down uh, on the list of my favorite Yakuza games. So uh, Barbie Project Friendship is uh, this game where you are playing as Barbie and Barbie. One of them's Malibu Barbie. The other one's Brooklyn. Uh, and, but however, their nicknames are both Barbie, and they're just like, <laughs> yay. Um <laughs> And you get to uh, this community center that your mom 
who's presumably the original Barbie, um, uh, was a big fan of when she was your age, which is like 18 or so. Um, and, uh, she recommends that you guys like, you know, spend some of your summer vacation going there and you go in there and it's in a huge state of disrepair and there's nobody there except this like, you know, old lady with a bad attitude named Letty. And she initially, like she reluctantly agrees to let you help her, uh, bring the community center back to life because it's about to be sold, uh, to this real estate developer who's going to turn it into a parking lot. Dun, dun, dun. And, uh, if you know anything about geography, I just want you to ignore everything about that plot, about it being turned into a parking lot. Cause I really hope that they're saying that as a hyperbole because the geography of this whole place does not make sense for a parking lot. Um, I was thinking of a good sound <laughs> clip we could have played. And it's like, they're going to turn it into a parking lot. <gasps> right. What? <laughs> That works. <laughs> so yeah, so they're going to turn it into a parking lot, and uh, so it's up to Barbie, Barbie, and her friends. Uh, who, as you unlock various areas, Barbie's like, "Oh, I know somebody who can handle this." Like Ken, he loves the beach and he loves ice cream. So guess what? He's now the lifeguard for the area because, I mean, with Barbie, you can be anything. Fair enough. Um. And so you unlock all these different areas, like the beach, the tech lab. Uh, there's an amphitheater where you can put on shows and stuff like that. Uh, there's a camping area. And of course, there's an animal rescue. So yes, in case you were wondering, unlike Nick Jr. Party, you can pet the dog in this game. Yay. <laughs> um, so. Oh, wait, no. Uh, we have a second clip for that, too. Yay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so the game uh, to get stuff done, it involves a lot. This is where the Yakuza uh, comparisons come into. It is a ton of fetch quests. And I really hope you like fetch quests because you are running from one end of this place to the other. And on top of it, uh, to break up the monotony a little bit, uh, you have to play all these mini games uh, that are specific to each area. And the game is like, oh, well, there's all these different mini games. No, there's not actually. You really have two different mini games that you're playing. They just they just jazz it up in different ways, um, mostly visual. Uh, and so what it is, is that you're either playing an overcooked style uh, mini game where you have to assemble stuff and get it out to the customers or you're playing rhythm games and the rhythm games are i mean it, it's not as bad as paw patrol uh the movie where like the pup boogie like just didn't register at all at all it's real difficult to time uh some of these mini games and so you will get a lot of misses, but at the same time, the game's just like, yay, you accomplished it. Good job. Um, and so that's, you know, it, it wouldn't be so bad if, if like there was actual variety to these games, but they're pretty much just reskins of two separate games. Uh, and all it is, is a ton of fetch quests. Now, there is customization with Barbie, because what is Barbie without customization? Um, and there are all sorts of outfits that you can unlock by completing missions or finding collectibles throughout the island. And then also you can purchase them uh, within the game. Not not purchase like with real money, but just yeah. with in-game currency that you earn by completing little quests and stuff like that. Um, and then... Yeah, and like the clothes are frustrating too. Not like frustrating as in like I don't I don't know if I if that's like the correct way to put it. But here's the thing. Okay. The idea of Barbie is that you can be anything, okay? And yeah. with with that, 
uh, part of the allure and draw of Barbie is all of the accessories and ways that you can customize your own Barbie uh, pretty much. And so with that, there's only one instance in this entire game where the game is like, all right, you must change into this outfit to do a certain thing. Otherwise, you're just like and like you're just doing it in whatever outfit you want it to be and i i can appreciate on one hand that they're just like oh you want to be a veterinarian that's dressed up as a rock star cool but the game never really encourages it ever again i mean yeah like you buy stuff from the store uh within the game and you unlock them in menus but after that initial mission at the very beginning the it doesn't encourage it ever again. Um, and I feel like that kind of misses the point of the, uh, of the accessorization of Barbie. And on top of it, it's just outfits. Like, it's not like you can, you can swap out like this shirt with this pants, uh, or do, or have Barbie, uh, have a certain hairstyle or have nails that are a certain color. Like, I mean, you remember the Barbie ads from when we were kids? Like they always had like those, like, Oh, you put water on her and all of a sudden there's magic makeup or like her nails are her done. Changes or like color. <laughs> right. There's none of that in this. And it's Man. just, what it sounds like, like a missed opportunity They're Like, yeah, like it, it's honestly, it, it like, it's frustrating because it feels like, yeah, on one hand, they got quite a lot of the messaging of Barbie, right? But then they also missed out on what makes the toys so special themselves. Um, and yeah, it just combined that with a ton of fetch quests. Like, you you got to be okay with doing tons of fetch quests um, <laughs> with this game. But it's really just, it's all running back and forth. Um, and on top of it, like, you have a beach. Do you get to go swimming? No. Do you get to go surfing? No. Like, do you get to do anything? Well, you get to run on the beach and you get to make ice cream. That's about it. Like, <sighs> like you have an animal shelter. Like you, you could be working in the animal shelter, like helping dogs and cats and like, you know, like, Oh, well we have to like, you know, apply a bandage to their leg or something like that. And instead it's, it's a rhythm game mm-hmm. where you're putting together food things. And it's just, it really it really is a missed out like there's a lot of missed opportunities with this and it's unfortunate well i will say one opportunity that was not missed is going to be the image for the episode uh if you want to oh, check no. your, your facebook messenger oh no I just i just sent you the image for the episode yeah <laughs> you left in the original thing right yes you did <laughs> beautiful beautiful yeah. <laughs> so Barbie Project Friendship clocks in at 40 bucks. What are your thoughts on it? If you've got a kid who's into Barbie or, you know, uh yeah, if you've got a kid who's into Barbie, like they might be uh into it. The thing is is that this also you have to look at this as this is a potentially the first game that some kid might play. Um, and so you really have to hope that this is going to entertain them for hours on end. So in that aspect, it's a very simplistic game and that's good for that. But I don't know that it's going to reach the demographic that they're actually targeting for this game. I will say that. Oh, that was another thing I wanted to bring up. Unironically, the soundtrack for this game slaps like. Nice. They have like they have a bunch of like these like rock and pop and uh some of them are like Taylor Swift ish like kind of ty- like songs back when she was more pop than like mid two thousands alternative, if you know what I mean. Um like the soundtrack is really good, but the only time that you ever actually get to hear it is during the mini games. And some t- like it all depends on how long that mini game runs. It might be a minute 30. It might be five minutes. And so there are times where you're never going to get to hear the whole song. And one of the things that I was completely, f- 
I will say flabbergasted by there's no jukebox feature for this game. Like there's no place where you can go in the game and just listen to the tunes that like you think are really awesome or stuff like that. If you want to listen to them, you have to play the mini game and it's just like, that's frustrating. And like, why, why, why wasn't there, why isn't there like some sort of jukebox feature? You have an amphitheater like area. Why is there, why is it not there? I really wanted to, I really, I really wanted to like this game, like for all like the, oh, this is going to be my next game of the year. Or like, this is the most hardcore game of all time. Like I really wanted to enjoy this game. And I feel like it was, there's a lot of missed opportunities within it, both in terms of gameplay and as the Barbie brand. That's a bummer. So, yeah. So if you've got, so if you've got a young kid, um, you know, I, I like, I, I could see this being given as a gift and it, you know, being a lot better than other kids titles out there. Um, and if you're an achievement hound, it's not the hardest game to clear, but, uh, I wish that this had been better. Yeah. Well, seems like a uh, kid's corner was, was somewhat of a letdown this week. Yeah, that's un- that's the unfortunate thing. I'm looking forward like, to next a lot week, of, though. There was a lot of potential, and it just kind of came up short this week, which is a bummer. But yeah, Sometimes it's like that. Yeah, they can't all be winners. Nope, especially if, uh, if we're on the show. Yeah, we can't be winners. No, 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 never. Bree's the only winner out of us. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And she's on her way to my house, so I'm going to wrap up this episode. Uh, Thanks to everyone for hanging out. Uh, Jacob, thanks for being here through the whole show. Thanks to Brie and Aki for doing their thing as well. Music this episode, we're going to wrap up Halloween month with some more one-ups. Something off of their songs for the recently deceased album from 10 years ago. How crazy is that? Uh, Pretty crazy, I guess. My back hurts. That's what I'm saying. Oh, that because you're old. Yeah, yeah, we're old. We are. Which is yeah. why we review kids' games. So, of Jake, course, give us some final words to end the show. Uh, don't run with scissors. That's fair. Don't eat paste or paint chips. Now it depends on the paste. Like if it's liquid glue, Elmer's no. But like the paste in the jar from elementary school, that's fair game, man. I. I mean, it's non-toxic, so I suppose so. Yeah. Don't eat paste, kids. 